Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fall Prose launch of Woolsack and Wynn Publishers Limited and Buck Rider Books. Thank you for being here. And we are so excited to be launching four amazing books tonight. One nonfiction title by Jenna Butler and three wonderful novels by Anne Stone, Mark Sampson, and Susan Purley. But before we get to these books, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you all the publisher of Woolsack and Wynn, Noelle Allen. Noelle? Hi, Paul. Oh, am I unmuted? No, I'm on. Okay. Is that the 2020 thing? Is my mic on? Um, thanks to everyone for coming um, and joining us tonight. I don't know what the weather is like where you are, but it's beautiful here in Hamilton breezy and warm and just, just a gorgeous outside. Um, but again, a thank you all for coming. And I wanna thank our funders, uh, especially this year. We, we could not have done what we've done this year without them. The Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Ontario Media Development Corporation and the Department of Canadian Heritage. They're always critical, but this year they're even more so. Um, I'd like to start tonight with an land acknowledgement. Uh, it, it does feel a bit strange to do this when we're all scattered across the country, but Woolsack and Wynn is lucky enough to be rooted in Hamilton and the city and the land that it rests in shapes what we do as publishers. So um, the city of Hamilton is situated on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792, which is between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And of course, we all know that the land acknowledgement, while an important first step in reconciliation is only the first step. And as a press, we are committed to taking further action. Um, but what I'd like to do now is to introduce our first reader this evening, who is Jenna Butler. I am delighted to be introducing Jenna. This is the second book that Jenna and I have worked on together and it has been an absolutely wonderful journey. I believe Jenna is one of the most elegant and evocative nature writers in Canada, but she's also one that is determined to make a difference and to, and to save what she can of the environment, um, especially the environments that she lives in and writes about. Her books are filled with beautifully written, but often hard truths. But what everybody finds in her writing, and I find especially, is that there's a really a deep hopefulness to her work that makes it a little bit easier to, to, to keep going, to, to gives you a little bit more to work with there. Um, and I'm gonna let Jenna tell you more about Reverie, A Year in Bees. But first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Jenna. Jenna is the author of three critically acclaimed books of poetry Seldom Seen Road, Wells, and Aphelion. She's an, 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 an award-winning collection of ecological essays, a profession of hope, farming on the edge of the Grizzly Trail, which we did bring out in 2015. And she's also written a poetic travelogue, Magnetic North, A Sea Voyage to Svalbard. Butler's research into endangered environments has taken her from America's deep south to Ireland's Ring of Kerry, from, the volcan from volcanic Tenerife, on the Arctic Circle on board an ice class masted sailing vessel, exploring the ways in which we impact the landscapes we call home. A professor of creative writing and environmental writing at Red Deer College, she lives with seven resident moose and a den of coyotes on an off-grid organic farm in Alberta's North Country. And I'll just turn this over to you, Jenna. Thanks so much for the really generous intro, Noel. And yeah, welcome to my off-grid farm. Um, where I zoom by candlelight. <laughs> so I just, before I get started, I just wanted to say a big thanks to everyone at Woolsack and when it's been a pleasure and a privilege to work with you on a second book and to everyone joining us today for the launch. Thanks for your time with us today. Um, I'm, as Noel mentioned, I'm off grid up in the Alberta bush. So I just want to acknowledge that I'm writing from Northern Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, the Soto, the Nitsitapi Blackfoot, the Métis and the Nakota Sioux. And this is where our small off-grid farm is located. 
So I'm going to be sharing a short reading from Reverie with you folks tonight. And Reverie is a book of essays about hope. It's a book of essays about climate grief. And it's about trauma recovery. And all of this is couched in uh, beekeeping narratives. My husband and I started keeping bees at the farm a few years ago. And so this is by no means a professional beekeeper's journal. It's a journey of discovery. And as we started keeping bees, we started learning about the wild bees and the larger ecosystem that we've been building our farm in here for coming up on 16 years now. So I'm going to be reading from a, a chapter towards the end of the book called Tell It to the Bees. It's an old beekeeper's adage that I've heard from numerous friends over the years. When someone in the house dies, you must go out into the bee yard and explain why your loved one won't be coming around anymore. When things in your life shift seismically in this way, you must always tell the bees. So who do you tell then when the bees themselves are dying? In the summer of 2016, we nearly lost our farm for the second time in five years. First in 2012 and again in 2016, the rains caught up with a part of the boreal that we call home. The first flood summer saw our market garden underwater through to the start of August. The beds we'd spent six years amending and developing disappeared under a peaty cloud of flood water. The perennial bed sank and the flowering orchard by the end of the summer had rotted to pieces. Even the lilac bush we planted together as we, we renewed our wedding vows that summer, surrounded by family and friends, drowned. We rebuilt the next year. My husband Thomas tilled up the good black soil from elsewhere on the farm, and I hauled yard after yard of it in the Vermont cart to spread across the beds and raise them above the water line. We re-sowed the small lawn and we planted a palm full of hopeful lily bulbs. By the end of the summer of 2013, our market garden was beginning to look like home again. We had a few fortunate years after that, still with high water tables, but nothing unbearable. The mosquito populations were worse, but the bats flourished in response. The pathways between the beds were often squidgy underfoot through July, but we had a thriving chorus of frogs. And then in the spring of 2016, our county flooded again. This time, the flood water came right up to the edges of the gravel pad that surrounded our tiny cabin. The water lingered in the underbrush and the beloved market garden we had tended for a decade disappeared for good, swallowed up by a stagnant pond full of bulrushes. That was the spring that climate change really came home to us on the farm. Helplessly for the water, toads webbed ropes of spawn through what had once been the grass of the lawn. One morning, we woke up in a startled rush in our cabin surrounded by water, certain that we could smell smoke. That was the day that the beast roared toward Fort McMurray. The vast forest fire would scorch the city and chase thousands down the highway to the south, fleeing for their lives in a convoy of taillights. It was a surreal summer of flooding and smoke, the days alternately choked by a thick amber haze or a black veil of mosquitoes. And as the disastrous months wore on in their trademark understated way, the bees started quietly entering the endangered species list. Seven species of yellow-faced bees native to the Hawaiian Islands appeared on the endangered species list in 2016, the first bees so noted. Perhaps it was because they were indigenous to a place so far away from the mainland United States, or perhaps it was because they looked more like wasps than they did the honeybee darlings so loved by the media, but their entry to the list was met with relatively little fanfare. It was only six months later that the news truly made waves, the beast having safely been extinguished, our farm still underwater. The first bumblebee had been added to the endangered species list. If you wanna hit people where it hurts, Hit us in the part of our hearts that holds a lingering need for the impossible. In this case, contemplate the unlikely flight of the rusty patched bumblebee, and then tell us that this creature is not just threatened, it's literally almost gone. People wrote letters of protest to politicians to argue for increased monitoring and environmental protection. A short documentary film appeared about the bee's plight. With the catastrophic decline of this compelling creature, we suddenly sat up and we paid attention. But the trouble with our attention is that it's a fickle thing. 
It's prone to change focus when something disappears from the media or when an animal proves to be not quite interesting enough for a long enough spell. And so for a while, we went on being fascinated and bothered by the plight of the rusty patch bumblebee. And then we just resumed voting to pave paradise and spray the cracks with a hefty dose of weed killer. In the space of a year, 2016 to 2017, seven bees entered the endangered species list. In the space of a year, the boreal forest burned on a scale large enough to evict an entire city. In the space of a year, we lost our farm again. You can rebuild a whole city or move a farm more easily than you can resurrect one tiny species on the edge of collapse. The residents of Fort McMurray bravely rebuilt after the fire that took their homes, though the boreal forest all around them remains tinder dry to this day, spurring new fires with every summer lightning storm. We moved our entire farm half a mile away to the old hayfield, and we set up our garden again from scratch on higher ground, though the water chased us and the groundwater levels in the county continue to be the highest we've seen in 16 years. And the rusty patched bumblebee continued to decline, its population present in only about 0.1% of its total overall range. In 2018, climate grief became a recognized term increasingly used to describe the loss of hope and the feelings of helplessness experienced by many in connection with human created climate change. I experienced a prolonged period of this too before I learned the term for it, a period that lasted almost three years and is still ongoing. And at the heart of my despair was the same sentiment that underpinned the American conservationist Aldo Leopold's words, I'm glad I shall never be young without wild country to be young in. My generation will likely be the last one to have a chance at dying before deaths begin to be more directly correlated to climate change than to old age or to infirmity. A world reconfigured by global warming is the one my daughters would have inherited had they lived. It is the world my students will inherit and my little nephew. It is not a world I can forgive myself for leaving to them. It's this thought that's galvanized me to begin wading through my climate grief. Too often grief and guilt on that scale leads us to a sort of stunned inaction. And the longer you and I sit idle, the more likely it is that our loved ones will inherit a planet that looks rather more like a punishment than a gift. I can't help but think of Senator Murray Sinclair's words to a gathered audience of several hundred students, faculty, and community members at Red Deer College back in 2016. He said that guilt stops us from moving forward, from changing for the better. Shame though, that's a different story. Shame makes us actively want to repair what we've done wrong to make things right. I can't stop the forest fires of the boreal, but I can plant diverse stands of native trees here on the farm including the large clumps of aspens that the wildfire scientists and the backwood firefighters know as asbestos forests for their ability to act as living fire breaks. I can't stop the summer deluges that have become the new norm in the county, but I can study how to enrich the soil with cover crops and no-till methods to improve its permeability to rain. And I can't stop the rusty patch bumblebee from disappearing from the rest of its range, but I can observe, catalog, and plant for the wild bees here on the farm in a much more intentional way. I can sit with my grief and I can act on my shame in the most mindful ways in which I am able. There are no perfect solutions. Even to hint at such comes across as being glib. But I will write letters like never before to my members of parliament and to my premier, to a political party currently in power in my province that I feel little affinity for and that has shown itself to have no respect for the land under its care. I will commit to informing myself as much as possible about what's happening in the world around me when it comes to the actions of large corporations and high polluting industries, because I fervently believe that individuals do need to make mindful personal changes, but big industries must be called to account for their impact on our world. And I will tell the bees, not just of my fears and of the great losses being sustained around the globe, but of my deep and abiding ache for the planet that the coming generations will inherit. I'll tell the bees that my grief at the end of the day looks an awful lot like love. Thanks for listening, folks. And thank you, Jenna. Uh, I can think of uh, very few things uh, other than the, the bee uh, whose reputation amongst uh, people of my generation has changed so much in my lifetime.
as a small child, bees struck fear into us. And, uh, and today, certainly, few things are as admired and beloved as the, as the humble bee and the bumblebee. And what a gift it is to have such a beautifully written account of what it means to live and raise these creatures. Thank you, Jenna. I'd like to move on to our next reader tonight, who is Anne Stone. And Anne Stone has written the novel Girl Minus X. And we're very pleased to uh, present it to you tonight. Uh, before I tell you a little bit more about Anne and her book, I'd like to remind you that all of our new prose titles, fiction and nonfiction that we're launching here tonight, are 30% off uh, at the Will Second Win uh, website until, uh, until this Sunday. And if you purchase all four books, uh, your savings will amount to $25.50. So that's a considerable savings. And of course, we're all here to... Uh, launch these books so that you can have them and read them and enjoy them. Uh, so do uh, do check out our uh, our website and uh, periodically uh, Brianna Woderbeck will be reminding you in the chat window uh, of, about uh, the availability of our books and of our 30% discount. Um, now let me tell you uh, about uh, Ann Stone. I've been a fan of Anne Stone's writing for a very long time, uh, since the 90s. Uh, I can tell you that for, uh, <laughs> for, for certain. Um, Anne is the author of three previous novels, Delible in 2007, Hush in 1999, and Jax in 1998. And, um, and she's a remarkable writer. And when the opportunity to work with her uh, came up at Wilsack and Win. I was uh, I was so pleased, and when I read the manuscript, I was even more so, uh, more more pleased than than I could imagine because the book is absolutely brilliant. It is a page turner and a, 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 such a thrilling read. Um, this is a timely book. This is a book about a pandemic, and instead of uh, a virus that attacks the lungs and bloodstream and all the terrible things that that the virus we're facing today uh, does. This virus in Anne's, in Anne's book attacks the memory. And you can imagine the kinds of uh, narrative uh, struggles that this, this presents to our protagonist, Danny, who uh, must flee the city to save her little sister. And what an adventure, what a, a thrilling read Girl Minus X is. It's a book that will appeal to readers of all ages. I think the potential for a real crossover hit with young readers and, and old readers alike. And um, let me tell you what some of the people have been saying about uh, Girl Minus X. David Cherry Andy, the uh, great writer in his own right, says Girl Minus X is what happens when great writing meets mesmeric page turning plot. And Emily Paul Weary says, uh, now, if you would let go of your trauma, uh, what if you could let go of your trauma? Now, what if the process was forced on you by a virus that robbed you of all your memories? Girl Minus X explores the bond between humans surviving mid-apocalypse. Nobody writes like Anne Stone. Get prepared for the unthinkable. And uh, in a recent uh, review in Publishers Weekly, uh, it stated that Stone's brilliant breathless novel will put readers in mind of Emily St. John Mandel mm -hmm. and Margaret Atwood. And uh, we certainly think that Anne is a great writer and we think that you're gonna enjoy Girl Minus X. And here to give you a taste of that book is Anne Stone. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Paul, for the very like generous introduction and um, for your work. You've been a great editor. You've been a steadying force. like. Um, for me, very helpful in terms of how to negotiate what I was doing when I came to the book. So just thank you for such a great experience. And Noelle um, and Jen and Ashley and everyone at Walsack and Win. I'm so grateful for the work that you've done in the circumstances that you're doing it. It's just... Um, I'm, I'm surprised by your commitment and your work through all of this, and I'm just grateful. Um, because I'm in Vancouver, I want to acknowledge where I am, that I'm on, I'm on unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. 
Um, I think it's so great to see the different land acknowledgements um, reflecting the different places where we're sat this evening. Um, I'm gonna read a really early scene. I think Paul's done a great job of giving sort of an overview. I decided to just go from the beginning because um, I don't have to explain or backtrack. It sort of throws you in. Um, what you should know, I guess, is that the social system <clears throat> in this world in which there's a pandemic is overburdened, that um, Danny, having lost her mother, has been in the care of her aunt as a guardian and her aunt's parole has been revoked. And so Danny's there with her sister um, and it's the two of them and they've fallen into the cracks of the system. And I think she just wants, is intent on staying in that crack um, until she can figure out a way to move forward without getting taken up by that system again, which was a very traumatic experience for her. Um, so I'm going to read the opening. She's a 15 year old kid. She's gone to a picnic at the prison outside of the prison. That's like basically a, a hospice to care for people who are infected and they're using as human resources prisoners or exploiting prisoners to do that work. And her aunt is one of those prisoners. Um, so I'll just open it up. Danny can just make out the ruined rails of the roller coaster, black bones rising into sky. She knows better than to be here, knows to leave well enough alone, knows the smart thing to do is turn her back and say goodbye. She knows all of this, but it's not so easy letting go of those you love. So Danny takes one step and then another, huffing her way up the hill as her kid sister falls behind. When they crest the hill, she sees the whole of the prison. The old racetrack is girded by fences, each topped with razor wire. Where once were horses, she sees infected. Where once were grooms, she sees prisoners in orange jumpsuits. And watching over all of them, inside and out, military guards. Below them, scattered across the face of the hill, a dozen little groups. The families of the women they've locked up inside. Some cluster around foam coolers, some sit on what scant grass can be found and some, she can tell, have given up on the visit. Laid out on old blankets, their faces are tuned to the clouds. Some, like her, have one eye on the prison hospice. Danny is scanning the compound when the kid's tiny hand slips into hers, tugs once, twice. Give me a sec, she tells her sister, Mac. Danny wants to see Aunt Nora, but there's no sign of their aunt, not yet. But there, just inside the fence, Danny spots a chicken coop. Beside the coop, a half dozen birds are stacked in tiny cages. Stunned and ragged, the birds shift on bony feet. In one of the cages, a bird lays dead. Its legs jut out stiff as popsicle sticks. There's an old and stunted apple tree at the bottom of the hill, but it's not nearly tall enough. And besides, it's too far from the fence. But there, beyond the apple tree, she sees an enormous maple with leaves the size of dish rags. The maple is close to the fence and a few of its branches arch up and over the barbed wire. Her eyes follow the largest branch, trace a path over the razor wire, make a 10 foot drop to the chicken coop's roof. Again with the tugging, but Danny is looking at the race course, an oval track dotted with a hundred of the infected, more virals than she's ever seen together in one place. Stick thin legs, sallow skin, a strange human herd. But herd's not the right word. Together like this, the infected don't move like any group of animals Danny has ever seen. They don't move like a crowd of people either. Each viral's path is erratic. When she traces pathways over the track, she sees dark particles in a stirred glass, atoms in Brownian motion, and then a picture of the virals lives in her mental album too, for always, added to all of everything she's ever seen in this world. At the center of the field, a few stand with faces tipped to the sun, stumbling in slow circles. She takes in their faces, but none is familiar or else all of them are. On each yellow jacket, a little metal clasp flashes when the viral hits six o'clock. Round and round they go, slowly spinning tops. The virus, she knows, has left its mark on the brains of the infected. 
At this stage, the gray matter is riddled with tiny holes, the hypothalamus shriveled up like an old pea, the cortex and medial temporal lobe pitted with deep, unforgiving lesions. The virus causes all kinds of symptoms, but that's not what gets to Danny. What gets to her is this. Once the disease has gone this far, the infected forget. They forget just about everything. They forget to even care. They forget friends and loved ones. They forget how to act, how to be. They forget who to be. Looking out over the prison hospice, Danny knows the virals she sees are literally dying. But at this stage, people say, death hardly makes a difference. Only it isn't virals she sees dying inside of the hospice, not really. It's people, isn't it? Maybe not legally, not anymore, but Danny knows it. They're people still. Thank you. Oh, oh, and one more thing. Um, I am like totally happy that you guys all came out. And when I get nervous, I make things. I made little buttons of all the different books. So here's one for Reverie. Here's one for mine. Here's one for Mark's and Susan's. If anyone wants a button, I have a bunch. Just like shoot me off an email at my website and I will mail you one. I have, I have little things I make because I get nervous and I like to make things. So they're there. I'm happy to give them to you. I just need an address and I throw them in the mail and that makes me happy. So enjoy. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anne. And uh, count me in for those buttons. I think those are, those are great and I'd be proud to wear them. Um, and I'm proud as well to introduce our next author tonight who is Mark Sampson. Like, like Anne, Mark is the author of several books that I've admired over the years. And, but this is the first time we've had a chance to work together. Uh, and this is Mark's first book with Wolsack and Wynn, and we're very proud to bring it to you tonight. Um, Mark is the author of other novels like The Slip and Sad Peninsula and Off Book, and he is the author of uh, the short story collection The Secrets Men Keep and the poetry collection Weather Vane. So he's a, he's a very multi-talented writer, uh, and the book that he brings you tonight is the novel All the Animals on Earth that... Uh, I may be biased, but I, I, I would wager that is his greatest book yet. And uh, I am very, very happy to have had the chance to work with Mark on this book. The protagonist of this book is the, um, I would say somewhat uptight, mm -hmm. stick in the mud, human resources manager, uh, Hector Thompson, but he has his faults too. Um, He's a man who doesn't like change, and he's a man of very little imagination, which works against him when his world turns upside down. Um, Hector lives in a world where people more or less have stopped having children. There's a, a bit of a population slump. And uh, the thing that comes along to set things right is uh, a process that turns animals like squirrels and pigeons and cats and dogs into, into, into human-like beings. And this throws Hector's world into disarray. And you can imagine the comical and, uh, and the adventure possibilities in a story like this. And Mark Sampson hits just all the right notes in All the Animals on Earth. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Paul. Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent, very good. Yes, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here tonight. Thank you everyone for coming. It's really great to see uh, so many familiar names among the attendees. Um, Paul, the feeling is mutual. I've, I've had a editorial man crush on Paul for many, many years and have wanted to work uh, with him for a long time. And I'm just so thrilled that I have finally been able to do it uh, with this book, All the Animals on Earth. Um, just a few other quick thank yous. Um, I want to thank my uh, first readers, uh, my wife, Rebecca Rosenblum here in Toronto, uh, Art Moore in Moncton, and Patrick Hadley in Salt Lake City. Uh, you guys were excellent to, to help me uh, in the early drafts of this book. Um, I also want to thank uh, agent Stephanie Sinclair for repping the book. Um, and of course, thanks to everybody at Woolsock and Wynn, Paul, Noelle, Jen, Ashley, everybody, thank you so much for uh, what you do and everything you do um, for your authors. It's just been a, an incredible journey. Um, so yeah, like Paul mentioned, my book uh, is a tale, I guess you would categorize it as a parody of a, of a dystopian novel or a parody of a science fiction novel. Um, 
uh, it takes place in an alternate uh, version of reality, one that is suffering from depopulation. It's not that people can't have kids, it's just that en masse they've decided, most of them have anyway, not to have kids. And this cratering of the, of the world's population has caused all manner of, of social calamity. So to resolve the issue, scientists um, develop a process called pollulation, which turns certain species of birds and mammals into a humanoid form, a, a humanoid creature, and these creatures uh, get a nickname. Um, they take on the nickname of bloomers, and um, and they're basically everywhere. After a terrible accident happens, and 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 their creation happens on mass, um, it basically quadruples the the population of the planet overnight. Um, these bloomers bring with them some exceedingly strange and unsettling behaviors and customs, including very acts of group sex and and other kind of strange behavior that throws um, the world for a loop. And the novel is really about Hector, the, the button down HR manager who is struggling with all the abrupt and disturbing changes that are sweeping across society in, in the wake of, of pollulation, the wake of this process. So I'm just gonna read a short excerpt uh, near the beginning of the book. Pollulation has happened. Um, these creatures are everywhere and uh, Hector is already seeing uh, a dramatic change in his world. Summer came and Morgana was done teaching for the year. Her two months vacation stretched out before her like a river of relief, as stress had been brewing at the school board in the wake of pollulation and had begun bleeding into the classroom. Teaching had always been a sweet gig for my wife, enrollments being what they were. With only eight to ten kids per class, she could grow close to each and every one of them, remembering their names for years to come, recalling which instruments they had played and which of the kids had loved music and which ones had really struggled with it. But now, ministries of education all over the world were raising difficult questions about how to go about the mass instruction of bloomers. With great haste, Morgana's own school board had set up huge teaching farms throughout the city, old abandoned warehouses converted into giant classrooms, and they hired any unemployed person with a university degree, there were lots of them, to come in and teach. Because bloomers were such quick studies, they managed to move through the system fast as if on a conveyor belt, and there were always more to take their place. Talk now involved mobilizing the entire teaching profession come September to deal with the overflow. Morgana and her colleagues were given a choice of working during their uh, vacations in these farms, but she promptly turned it down. Come next summer, she told me, it may not even be optional. Better to enjoy this year's summer break in case it might be her last. On the first day of her vacation, I came home from work to find her bouncing off the walls. At first, I thought it was due to all the construction noise coming from the condo unit next to ours. The neighbors had begun what sounded like a rather complicated renovation, and the days, and even some evenings, had been full of drilling and banging and grinding and crashing. But no, that wasn't it. I've got it, Morgana said, skipping through the living room toward me and throwing herself into my arms as I set my briefcase down. Oh, Hector, I've got it. Got what? I asked with a smile, throwing my keys onto their little table by the door as Morgana dangled and swayed off my shoulders. Her kinky brown hair looked damp and her long, creamy neck carried the faint scent of chlorine. What I want my main activity to be this summer, she replied. Come see. She led me by the wrist to the couch where her computer rested open on the far cushion. We sat and she placed the machine on her lap to show me the website she'd been looking at. Morgana, I learned had fled all the noise coming from next door and spent a good portion of the day at the community center next to our condo building, a cheerful, brightly lit touchstone for the mixed income citizens of our neighborhood. The center was one of my wife's absolute favorite places. It contained an Olympic sized swimming pool, a large library branch, a gymnasium, and a lovely sculpture strewn garden with picnic tables where you could eat your lunch on sunny days. Morgana had gone there to return some library books and browse around, then took a long leisurely swim in the pool. As she was leaving the community center, she passed the bulletin boards on the wall near the ping pong tables and saw a large garish flyer tacked to the cork. It <clears throat> featured a web address that offered more information. She showed that website to me now. I called the number. They're auditioning for lots of parts, including music assistant. I think it would be ideal for me. Oh, I agree, I said, channeling some enthusiasm. The web page read, Community Theater 647 needs volunteers for Harpies the Musical. Come be a part of this fresh, raunchy retelling of Lysistrata. Raunchy, I thought. Oh dear. 
I spoke to the director, Morgana said. And you know what she told me? She said this play won't be so much a retelling of Lysistrata as an inverse of the story, which, as you know, would suit me right down to the ground. I did know this. As mentioned, Morgana had done her undergraduate degree in classics, and there was a time in her life when ancient Greek theater had been the be-all and end-all of culture for her. Of the ancient Greek playwrights, the greatest of these, as far as she was concerned, was Aristophanes. And of his 11 surviving plays, the greatest of these, as far as she was concerned, was Lysistrata, a cheeky little number. It told the story of a group of women from the warring city-states of Athens and Sparta, Sparta who conspired together to withhold sex from their menfolk to get them to stop fighting and negotiate a peace. Morgana wrote her honors thesis on the play, and while she loved Lysistrata with all her heart, she did argue therein that a flaw marred the play's core premise. All that pent-up aggravation and sexual energy, she claimed, would make the men want to fight with each other more, not less. Morgana's thesis posited that Aristophanes should take the exact opposite approach with his play, turning it into a kind of proto-porn movie where Lysistrata and the gals overwhelm their men, sexually exhaust their men to get them to stop fighting. This, it turned out, was more or less the concept behind Harpies, the musical. I tried not to blanch as my wife described it to me. The whole show was to be a series of orgies set to show tunes. Good gravy, I thought. <clears throat> they may have to change the name from Harpies, the musical, to Herpes, the musical. I couldn't believe the coincidence of it, Morgana informed me. It's like this director is going to bring my thesis to life right there on the stage. That's uh, great, I said. So you'll um, audition for the role of music assistant, she restated. Apparently, if I play my cards right, I might even get to do a bit of composing. Oh, Hector, isn't that grand? Well, I'm excited, I said, feeling a rinse of relief. It sounds like a wonderful summer project for you. I took a moment then to linger on my own days in the theater as a child actor. This sometimes happened to me when Morgana announced she had managed to pull together some musical or show at school, and I would feel the warmth of my own memories on the stage long before I became a doyen of HR. But wait, I went on and gestured to the words on her screen. Doesn't Harpy mean like a, a harridan, you know, a, a coarse and disagreeable woman? Oh, they'll be coarse and disagreeable, all right, she said. These ladies are gonna wield sex like a stick in this play. I suspect the director wants to take back the term Harpy for women. You know, the way fat people have with Wido. That's fascinating, I said. I was about to say more, but we were interrupted then by the most thunderous, most hellacious explosion from the other side of our front entry's wall. Jesus, Murphy, I shouted as we both flinched on the couch. It sounded like a large monster had just vomited rubble into the hallway beyond our door. Morgana and I got up to investigate. Out in the hall, we saw that sure enough, the floor was strewn with broken plaster and a couple of sledgehammers brandished by two burly construction dudes in hard hats were retreating into a giant hole in the wall they had made not far from our neighbor's door. That door opened then and our neighbors, Terry and his wife, Agnes, a retired couple who had lived in the building for more than 40 years came out to greet us. Oh, hey folks, Terry said, sorry about all the noise. No problem, I lied. You, you guys seem to be undergoing quite a renovation there. Oh, it's more than a renovation, Agnes said. Terry, should I tell them? They looked at each other conspiratorially. I don't see the harm, he replied. Tell us what, Morgana asked. Well, a man came by the other week, Agnes said, a real estate guy, and you know what he did? He offered us one three fifty for our spare bedroom. He's converting it into a bachelor unit. Really, I said. My first thought was, how the hell did the condo board allow that? My second thought was, nobody offered us one three fifty for our spare bedroom. You've got to take advantage of these opportunities when they come, Terry said. Oh, I, I know, I replied distantly. So when does the new person move in? Morgana asked. People, Terry answered. People moving in. He's hoping to fit five, maybe six bloomers in there. A silence, a boggy, simmering dread dangled between us a moment. Well, Morgana said, her word curling upward in a kind of cheekiness. Sounds like the thumping and banging may become a permanent fixture. And by golly, didn't Agnes blush? Thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. That was awesome. Uh, I, I think a perfect encapsulation of, of Hector's sort of pent up personality. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that readers are going to enjoy it, uh, which reminds me, do check the, the uh, Will Sack and Win bookstore on our website, which is willsackandwin.ca. And um, our 30% discount on the titles that were 
uh, launching tonight lasts until this Sunday. So take advantage of that. And uh, our final author for tonight is Susan Purley. And uh, this is Susan's second novel with Will Stack and Wynn and her, her third novel to date. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Susan Purley. She's a fiction writer and a former radio journalist and war correspondent. Uh, her previous novels are Death, uh, Death Valley and Love Street. And the uh, novel she's launching tonight is Stella Atlantis. Uh, I have to tell you that Stella Atlantis and Death Valley are um, books that are related to one another, but it would be, I think, inaccurate to say that Stella Atlantis is a sequel to Death Valley. Um, certainly, both novels have uh, some characters in common. The main characters uh, live and and and. Uh, experience life in, in both novels. Um, but I don't think it matters uh, which order you read them in. Um, and uh, I think that's a unique thing for uh, books that sort of have the same characters going on adventures in one book to the next. It doesn't matter which order you read them in. Uh, neither one is a prequel or a sequel to the other one. Uh, it's just another story uh, in, set in this world with these fascinating characters. Death Valley, of course, was uh, 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 appeared on the long list for the uh, Scotiabank Giller Prize when it came out. And we're very pleased to bring uh, Stella Atlantis to you tonight. Uh, we've just listened to a story in which uh, animals uh, become people and um, it, it, in the story that we're about to hear more from, uh, there is a person who becomes an animal. Uh, the title character, Stella, uh, reappears, uh, comes back from the dead, as it were, as an octopus. And if that doesn't get your imagination fired up, then Susan Purley uh, will certainly take care of that for you. Please welcome Susan. With the dead, you can float. With the dead, you can go anywhere. Finally, you can fly. You are airborne to Soyuz and Cassini, surfing the aurora borealis through the astrophysical waves. The rain moves in from Tripoli, Benghazi, Latakia, the Mediterranean stations. The windy rain crosses the water to Iberia, from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, those North African shorelines. The dead are dead, yet the dead tremble against us. The dead are dead, yet they leave strange vibrations. The dead are wet with knowledge. People, the dead are known to the rain. Paul, thank you for the lovely introduction. My editor, Paul, working together with you all these years, and this time we're sailing on the good ship Stella Atlantis. And thank you to Noel and to Ashley and to Jen and Brianna at Woolsack and Wynn. And a special shout out to Michelle Verana, the designer who just made such an exquisite book. And I'm just so grateful. Here we are. Stella Atlantis, the story of a husband and wife estranged in a split screen marriage. Vivian Pink is right now at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The trees in the orchard were raining the angry architecture Van Gogh put into the blossom spring rain. He told the story of the future that the blossoms tell. There will be fruit. After the blossom rain, the green knobs will come and the peaches will come with the pears. Vincent van Gogh, master of anticipation, master of the spring lung. Vivienne and her new boyfriend, Alexi, sat on a bench in the room with the spring breath held by the painter. Vivienne felt the scars in every van Gogh orchard, the cuts, how the apple blossom snow knifed the turquoise. Oh, Van Gogh knew all about how you missed things and how you hid that missing and how your hidden parts were violence to your body. Her hair had fallen off. Vivian listened with her eyes. Van Gogh knew he made scouring ballads of lost time. Van Gogh knew how nature was a crime scene. 
Van Gogh in the present green was eternally rolling back the years into dark workers' corners, moving from the soot nights illuminated to the night hawk fluorescence. He knew that in every sunny day, the end is nigh by your century's methods. There will be cafes. Vivian wanted to immerse in Van Gogh's restless healing, his fish and ballads in paint. How Van Gogh could make the coming of spring feel like a dirge as played by early Eric Clapton. The brazen recluse and deeply inhered in every Van Gogh was the sense of regret. The regret that having nailed the thing you gave up so much for, now that the love affair between you and the nomad light was finally over and in a frame, your secret heart was revealed at last. Van Gogh who read and adored the poetry of Walt Whitman. Van Gogh in the pool hall with the cyanide crows. Vincent who lived in a personal dark room and walked with dilated pupils into the old hay. A man bred in Northern light who inhaled Southern light as if it were a bad necessary opioid. He painted the sky as trauma. He parsed the elements of paint as if they were small children. He was curious. His blue room was originally purple. He knew the world was a bomb shelter. His fugitive paint made by new inventions chemicals did not last and will not last the way the old guy's paint will. He knew the world was embers and the rain was made of kerosene. Van Gogh made a starry night into a heart attack. After the atomic bomb, Vivian said, getting up from the bench, my eyes were blown. My irises were all over the place. I had tunnel focus. I saw things the way a civilian sees, which was shit for my working. I couldn't feel what was lurking just this side of the outside of the frame. She walked back and forth in front of the varieties of blossoms, the many peach tree presentations, the peach, the pear, the almond, the war of the blossoms. There was not a scrap of sentimentality in Vincent. Every master has a knack. Vincent van Gogh's knack was to put you into that ballad. Willingly you went into the envelope of heartbreak and in tresses of cadmium red cyanide in long red asteroids, you went back to have your heart attacked again. Vincent van Gogh whispered to Vivi, go back to beginner's heart, go back into the pupa, go back to the place between larva and imago. And now we go to the other side, the split screen marriage. Johnny Coma is estranged from Vivian and he's in Barcelona. He's a writer and there he is. The sun got up slowly in Barcelona city. The old rooftops pushed into the rainy dawn. While he slept, Johnny fought the bedside lamp and the lamp won. Shit, there was broken glass on the floor. His knuckles on his left hand had ripped skin, a deep gash. There was blood on the pillow. Yeah, he'd been at it again. Back when he and Vivian were in bed together every night, she'd wake him up yelling at him to stop hitting her as he pounded her back, the back of her head, when her thick hair back when she had hair protected her from his sleep pummeling. And he'd be in a battle royale with some sleep enemy, some rem nemesis when he went nine rounds with Vivi's spine. The bedside water glass was way across the room under the little high window where the roof profile of Santa Maria del Mar was framed against the morning blue. Stone and azure and blood on the bed cover. What the hell time was it? Oh, it was 10 after 10. He better get up and get to the beach for his ritual morning caffeine. There was no time to clean up the mess. He was on a quest. He needed to bring his daughter back to him. The only obstacle was that Stella had died 12 years ago. He had entered his grief, then he had run from his grief. 
He was living in full incompleteness and he knew it. Being a clever guy was one sure way to be stupid. He was a know-it-all from the get, but grief was a rat who chewed the art right off your cheeks. He threw on a windbreaker, went down in the elevator, saw on the cobbles he had bare feet. Oh well, walking down to the water of the shoreline in PJs and calluses, and that hand, a deep gash, blood dried. What a fine chivalric suitor am I, he giggled. Giggly nutcase in pajamas on the city sidewalk. What else could he be but a well-known novelist, not remotely in hiding? A nut in a mumble of that rhythm he didn't want to lose. The light ahead was pure Mediterranean. The sidewalk was wide on Jean de Bourbeau, the restaurants asleep, a few bars, a few touristic joints serving food in English to Brits. Over yonder, the sails of docked boats, the old port, the wharf. The city presented itself like ghost opportunities. The dead had always been happy to sail to Barcelona. He'd fallen in love with Barcelona so long ago, and he had indeed betrothed himself to the city. He and Vivian had been here together. Now he was here alone, and often so. The public life consoled him. The light consoled him. It was lost, like him. He sat down on a random motorcycle on Jean de Bourbeau beside the recycling bin lineup, pulled out his moleskin notebook and his ideal Palomino Blackwing 602 pencil, and he wrote, Dear Stella, the icebergs melt. The walruses have no shelter. It has been raining for a long time and the plastic has risen from the sea. We have all gone down to the Haddle zone where midnight is forever and there is no day. We're down in the onyx without oxygen. And as it has been written, the cities have been built by architects and apocalypse. And when the Red Sea did part, it was festooned with plastic bags over fish heads. The migrant sea was a mass murder scene. He got up from the moto. The music in his wrist had receded. At the spot where Jean de Bourbeau met the beach promenade, humans were shadows, backlit. Humanity out early. 10.30 a.m. was early for Barcelona. The shadow bicyclist, the shadow man alone at the shore, the shadow dog walker and her shadow chihuahua. He felt like flotsam with a pencil, kelp carrying a Palomino Blackwing 602. He was moving toward waste and softness. This had to be the year. He had to go into the Stella zone and find her, finally. He had no tools, no idea how to do it, but he did have chops, he had that. He knew how to take a line for a walk. Maybe this was the year. Maybe this November, he could walk that line right up to the return of Stella Coma, who died one November long ago at age 11, his little girl. Thank you for listening. Maybe someday soon, we'll all get to meet in person and say, hey, in person. It really was a thrill. Jenna and Mark and Ann, thank you, Noel, again, and Paul. Until the next time, hasta la próxima. We'll see you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for that reading from your new novel, Stella Atlantis. And for my money, nobody writes about art better than Susan Purley. So thank you for reading that the, the passage with the Van Gogh painting. Just beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, you can get Stella Atlantis uh, at willsecondwind.ca. All of our novels tonight uh, retail for $22, which means if you take advantage of our 30% discount, uh, I, I think the, the price ends up being uh, $15.40, uh, which is a, a paltry sum. So surely you can agree to that. And, um, uh, and uh, Jenna's book is actually retailing for a little less than that. So certainly um, this is a, a, an opportunity to, to get these books. Uh, and uh, have them with you for what may be a long winter. Um, 
I know that we can't travel. And, uh, and as Susan said, it may be uh, a little while before we can do this kind of thing uh, in person and together. Um, but you can travel in these books and you can go on adventures and you can walk a little while with these fascinating characters that our authors have created for you uh, and these beautiful stories that they've written for you. And let's take some solace in that and let's celebrate literature and let's celebrate these books. Um, we're coming to the end of our event. Uh, so I would like to thank all of our authors who joined us tonight to help us launch these books. So thank you to Jenna Butler and to Ann Stone and to Mark Sampson and to Susan Purley. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues who I work with at Wolsack and Wynn, uh, our publisher, Noel Allen, our managing editor, Ashley Hisson. I'd like to thank uh, Jen Rollinson who has done an amazing job of producing this show tonight and making sure that all the technical things run smoothly. And I'd like to thank Brianna Wodebeck for keeping us all informed about uh, our, our, uh, our, our special offer for the books that we're launching tonight. And finally, my last thank you is to you, uh, our attendees, our audience who came here to help us celebrate these four wonderful books. Thank you for being with us here tonight. We do appreciate it. This, uh, this launch uh, has been recorded and will be posted uh, on our YouTube channel uh, very soon. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity to share this event with uh, those who couldn't be here to join us live. And, um, and we'll be getting word out about uh, when that uh, is posted very soon. So watch our Twitter feed, watch our Facebook, watch our Instagram, and we'll get that information out to you very soon. My name is Paul Vermeersh. I'm senior editor at Wolsack and Wynn. Thank you all for being here tonight and have a very good evening.